Hey everyone, you're listening to the Vent Podcast, your source for market insights, wine industry news, and updates on our current collections. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Vint Podcast. I'm joined as always by Billy and also our Director of Wine, Adam LaPierre, because today is a really big day at Vint, probably the biggest day since our 2021 launch back almost or a little bit more than a year ago when Vint launched its first collection in May of 2021. Today is Distribution Day. Our Champagne Stars collection, which launched in July of 2021 last year, it was our fourth collection. We're announcing today publicly to our investor community that we are able to provide a distribution on that offering. So we're really excited to return funds for the first time to our investors to bring to bear the thesis that we've had, that we've been sharing with you over time that wine can perform well, even while other traditional equity markets are not performing well. And I think we've actually been able to capture that really well with the sale of a portion of our Champagne Stars collection. I'll just give you a few stats and then we'll jump in and hear from Billy and from Adam about what kinds of considerations went into selling this offering and why Billy put this collection together in the first place back in 2021. So we were able to sell 22.09% of the total collection value from the Champagne collection. We were able to exit that portion of the offering And we sold those assets for just over $19,000 and are returning just under 20% at 19.97% on those sold assets. If you stretch that out, extrapolate that number out over a year, the IRR for the investment return is 21.73%. And that's phenomenal, we think, in relation to the bearishness of the traditional equity markets and you know the stock market being down 20 plus percent year to date, I believe. So Billy, Adam, if you want to jump in and first, maybe Billy, let's talk about what went into putting this collection um, back in putting this collection together back in 2021, shed some light on what the thought process was around champagne then, because we do know that champagne had an incredible run in 2021 and is continuing that run into the early part of this year. But tell our listeners a little bit about putting that collection together. Yeah. So bringing everybody back about a year ago, a little little more than a year ago this time, we were trying to decide, we had just launched our first collection. It went really well. And we were resubmitting to the SEC. So we were trying to identify categories of collections that would be, you know, really top tier or would be great for our first five collections. So we went through, you know, the categories throughout the world and, you know, Champagne has been a consistent performer for, for years and years. So we knew that that was going to have to be part of our, the collection. So for those of you who remember, there were Super Tuscan collections, Saint Emilion. So we went Bordeaux, Super Tuscans, obviously with Italy, and then we went Champagne. And the interesting part about Champagne at the time was through the pandemic, it had still seen some solid growth. You know, everything was kind of muted during that time, but that was during a time where there was a lot of supply chain issues. It was hard to get champagne throughout the world. People weren't going out as much and there still was some growth. So we knew that it was poised or the signs were pointing to that. It was it was poised for continued growth in 2021. We couldn't have anticipated the um, success that it had. And then we also knew that if we, if we chose the top tier producers, the Tete de Cuvées from the the biggest champagne houses that you know it would be a, a solid investment based on historical performance. So we were really excited to have this one available. And then I, I don't know how many of you were with us when you know a year ago, but the SEC qualification process took a little bit of time and we had a fairly decent gap in between our first collection and the next collections. And champagne was one of three collections that we launched in a basically the span of a week. And we were we were really excited to give it offer to our investors, but we were concerned, you know, maybe there might be a little fatigue after three collections in a row that it might take a little while to sell out. And luckily our community, I also identified the value in this collection and it, it sold out really quickly. So we were, we were really excited that, so it's been a, it's been a wild year. Yeah. I think it was yeah. a great selection of wines, Billy. And, and to your point, marquee names from Champagne around the time that you launched the collection, luxury goods and demand for luxury goods around the world were was continuing to surge and access to some of these wines were in short supply because of the supply chain issues too. So those were all important catalysts to consider when you put together the collection. 
Yeah, hundred hundred percent. And I, I think what's interesting here is we're we're seeing a how market trends can also dictate, you know, times. And I'll let you talk about this more a little bit more when you exit. But one of our interesting value props in this collection was, you know, as champagne ages over time, there was a strong correlation between vintage and and value appreciation, I guess. And, and what we were able to see in this past year was a nice condensing of that that time frame. Um, but we also did see some of our some of the older vintages also just performing well. So it, it's really interesting to see how Champagne is a kind of consistent performer of that. And you can look back historically and kind of can see this relatively consistent performance. It, it's, it's just a great category. And, uh, you know, there's a reason it has a global reputation. Yeah. The other interesting thing, it's it's a dynamic at play with certain regions and certain wines is the implementation of a global pricing strategy among suppliers and wineries. And that is something that is didn't really exist historically for a lot of markets where you had controlled controlled supply chains and routes to market. So you would often find these this pretty significant price dislocation between Europe, US, Asia. And I think across the board with champagne, you've seen wineries, champagne houses take a, a more holistic approach to their global pricing strategy, which has actually kind of tightened up these arbitrage opportunities and also had the effect of uh, increasing the prices across the board globally for some of these wines too. So part of it's demand driven, part of it's, you know, strategic from a, from a winery perspective. It's a massive feature, I think, of the way that we've structured our business to be able to take advantage of these opportunities in the market whether it be arbitrage opportunities or simply exiting a collection earlier than we thought. We are never forced sellers. We've positioned ourselves strategically in that way. And I think it's, you know, speaks to that on our original investment thesis, which I'm looking at here, the maturity date, the, the expected sale range was between 2023 and 2026. So, you know, investors should always anticipate that their money will be tied up in a collection you know, within that time frame, but I think it's really great also to outperform that expectation for our investors. And I think that speaks to how dynamic our team is in being able to take advantage of market opportunities. Can we go in a little bit, maybe here, Adam, talking about what did you see earlier this year in terms of the way the market was moving? Because we know that Champagne was up almost 50% in 2021 as a category and is continue, has continued pretty strong growth into the first half of this year. Why now? Why not a year from now? What do, why start that process at this time? Well, I think there's a, a and the idea of monitoring performance of individual collections is an ongoing process. So we are, we're doing that from day one. As soon as a collection goes live, it goes into our queue for monitoring performance. And, and that's, both quantitative and qualitative in nature. As it relates to the quantitative piece, obviously we're looking at global trading volumes. We're looking at the LiveX platform. We're looking at availability of individual wines on the market as a whole, uh, as it relates to stock availability, and also looking at global pricing trends, as you said, Brady, really looking at how, really looking at tracking pricing across a lot of different markets and also at different levels of the supply chain. So both B2B and B2C. In addition, we're looking at the qualitative piece. So we want to understand what are catalysts, potential catalysts for price appreciation, critical acclaim around specific vintages, which are drive demand and suck up liquidity and availability of specific wines, buzz about a region or an individual producer. And also looking forward, what is the What are the quality and sizes of these upcoming harvests and and all these kind of factors? And ultimately trying to to create an holistic perspective on a specific collection and then also drilling down into the opportunities around individual assets within that collection. And so we think that blended approach really gives us a, a great view on potential exit timing. One of the interesting things about investment grade fine wines and rare wines is the way that the pricing moves. It tends to be 
it, it's it's not linear from month to month, right? It 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 can often change in a in a step change fashion due to reduction in overall supply. And with some of the assets that we exited, we noticed that step change in price. And for us, that was a key moment to take advantage of the opportunity and exit while while that while, while price was favorable. For us, it's it's returning profits to investors at the right time, and we felt like it was the right time for those assets because you know now investors have the opportunity to redeploy that capital in into new collections or or in other ways. Yeah, and I again going back to the thesis, we have marked down on the investment thesis from last July that the one year return previous to the collection launch was more than twenty five percent. And so we've seen such a, you know, really a rocket ship in Champagne over the last, not, not just the last year, but the last two and even three years. As And we just launched a new Champagne collection at the end of this past week. And we'll have Adam on again on a later podcast episode to talk about finding value in these kind of bull runs. What does it, what does it look like from a liquidity point of view when the market is so hot? Everything's been trending upwards for a couple of years now. What does it look like on the sell side to access liquidity when you want to? You said we took an opportunity. Is that something that happens quickly? Is it something that we have to wait on? I think we're asking this for all of our investors who are skeptical about the fractional collectible and investment markets who say, ah, oh, like, you know, far less liquid than, you know, I can go on my phone and trade my stock, you know, second to second. What does it look like to actually seize an opportunity in a particular moment in a market like this? I think we are advantaged in that, as you mentioned before, we are not forced sellers. So we have the ability to wait for the right timing. There is definitely still strong demand out there today. I think anecdotally, I think velocity is slowed a little bit, but we we understand the market and we understand pricing well enough to know what the, you know, sort of what price will generate pretty quick liquidation. And so we're trying to strike that balance, of course, obviously, when we see that, you know, the, the, the immediate exit price for an asset is very favorable. That's, we would, we would employ one strategy. In other instances, we might set a target and know that there's a 25% chance we, we get a taker at that, at that ask. So it's it's a bit of a balance, but I think with with a pretty high degree of confidence, we understand what the correct price is to exit in a in a fairly short time frame. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that provides a lot of context for our investors who wonder, you know, how much of a particular market cycle, like the the bull run in a particular market cycle, is Vint going to be able to capture? I think it's really important for us, especially as we've launched Champagne Stars or Rosé Champagne Collection. And now our Comte de Champagne, Champagne from Tottenger, the three Champagne collections now, different points in the year. Uh, I think that's really important, you know, for investors to understand liquidity and what that looks like mm-hmm. in this market. It sounds like you guys have really thought through in a lot of different ways how to assess that. Yeah, and I think there are there are certain wines and categories where that is sometimes less transparent or less clear, and, and in particular, those are the the true rarities out there, the the very scarce vintages or producers, where there's just less availability, less it's it's less clear what the sale price is on a given day. In those instances, we really use we, we kind of broaden our data set, so we tend to look more at auctions and other sources of data to understand where is the recent demand and where where are these strike prices. With categories like champagne, very there's a significant volume and there's a lot of availability and liquidity. So there, you know, the the the, dy- the dynamic is pretty well known. And I, I think you know investors because we don't have a secondary trading platform, investors put a lot of trust in us to both protect their capital in a downturn, but also to take advantage of of you know these investments in upturn. And because this market is obviously there's so much that goes into assessing a particular asset, knowing when to sell, when to buy, these kinds of things. You really need expert and inside knowledge to be able to navigate these markets, which is, I think, why historically so many people go through brokers and, and other ex- experts and not just yeah. clicking buy on an online website. You know, 
And with stocks, I'm looking here, the S&P 500 is down almost 9.5% over the last year, over 18% year to date. And that's only that low because of a recent 5% run over the last five days. Wine uh, trending upward in almost every index, I believe, based on our our, our last the last time we looked at the LiveX indices. What does it mean to return 20% at this time in the market when other equities are down. Just comments on this asset class in correlation, in relation to other assets that people might be invested in. What does this mean for portfolio overall and maybe for people redistributing their funds into other assets or back into wine? Yeah. Well, I think you know, 20% is exceeds the historical range for wine as an asset class. It, 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 so we definitely beat the historical trends, but obviously it's, it's, an, it's an attractive return in, in these times. And I think wine is just such an interesting category in the alternative asset space as, as it relates to some of the other things that you see out there and that you know there is a lot of price history. There is a real market for these assets. And they are also consumable. So there are just so many interesting, there's a confluence of factors that I think make it a, a really interesting asset class. And, but to your point, the key is really being data driven and being grounded in the market to be able to understand fair valuation and to find value. Yeah. And, you know, when Adam says being data driven and, and focusing on some of these quantitative factors, you know, we're not employing AI and it's not ro robotic trading, we're really taking a holistic approach to how we assess the assets and how, you know, when we list an asset for potential sale or when we're purchasing assets, it's definitely a holistic approach that you've spoken to. Billy, how has that, how has that process changed since? you know, from back in 2021, when Adam, were you assisting in an advisory role when Billy was putting that collection together? And like, maybe how has that process changed from then to how we're assessing collections now? And clearly, whatever was happening then <laughs> has worked. So kudos to, to Billy, but I know that that process has been streamlined a little bit since Adam has come on. So how has that process changed over the last year? Yeah, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say the 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 quality of the analysis, I guess, is is gotten you know drastically improved. I want everybody to know that you know the quality of our analysis was was very thorough then, but I, I will say that you know we we at that time had to reach out to our wine investment committee and, and leaned heavily on them for their expertise. So that there was a lot of time involved with these. So I think what you're seeing now is really an expedited with Adam being on board, we get his years of experience and kind of you know firsthand knowledge, as well as a different perspective on how to better and more efficiently analyze these markets. So before we were taking multiple data sets and going through and kind of putting our perspective together and then having to go and run it by the committee, whereas now a lot of these things have been streamlined in-house. We have you know things that have been tried and true for years now. And then so it's really facilitating us to do more research faster and really provide, you know, unique perspectives. And hopefully here it's also scale up, you know, the collection sourcing. So I, I will say I, I, the quality was very good last year in 2021 of our research, but I think it's only improved and it's getting faster. So yeah, that's kind of our difference yeah. from last year. I think the, to your point, Brady, earlier about the blend of quantitative and qualitative and experience, what I'm trying to, what I'm bringing to the table is this experience and this knowledge of the fine wine market. So to an extent, I think that complements the, the quantitative work that we've always done and, and makes it more efficient. On the quantitative side, a few things that we are working on is automating, automating a lot of the processes. So really as opposed to doing a lot of the manual work to compile the data, trying to find ways to leverage technology and build tools to help us just get continue to get faster and more efficient in identifying opportunities and, and tracking performance. You know, it, it might take us a couple months to exit any given collection. It's not a, it, it, you know, it, it's not a secret that the wine markets are less liquid 
than you know traditional traditional equity markets like stocks. It's just a feature of this asset class, and so I, I really just want to stress how important it is, you know, for our listeners to consider the team that's managing your assets in terms of how dynamic we can be, how quickly we can act when we see opportunities. That's that, that's certainly something I think that we should stress when thinking about our first distribution. Here is you know we were really able to to move when we needed to move, and are continuing to do that with the last seventy five percent of this collection for invest. Investors who are getting distributions back, you will have already been notified at this point that distributions are available. Distributions will happen on a quarterly basis. So, you know, there will be times in the future, especially if a particular investor has been investing in maybe every collection along the way or has multiple, maybe a couple dozen collections in their portfolio that in quarters to come, you may be receiving distributions from multiple collections at one time. And so as for our investors, one strategy that I know a large swath of our community has taken, a strategy that I've taken is to invest in every collection along the way. And you kind of get a, a hopefully the goal is to have a, a trickle in of proceeds over time as collections are exited. That's always the goal with an investment company. So as we look ahead to the next couple of quarters, we're going to continue working on our champagne collection, I believe. Adam, tell me, would there ever be a world where, say, a quarter of a collection would be exited and then, you know, we might not attempt to exit the rest of that collection until a year later? Or could that happen if there's particular demand for one producer and not the rest of the producers in a collection? Just get a, give a sense of once this process is started... What does it look like to finish it out? Because you know we've we've only sold about a quarter of this offering right now. Yep, it it really does depend on the specific assets, and for us, we don't want to be formulaic at the expense of leaving money on the table. So it it really is looking at the individual assets. I think, and to your point, yes, there there could be there could be specific wines in the collection that we that we do hold for another year or more. Because a lot of the factors that drive price appreciation are producer specific and also vintage specific. Mature wines that are in, within their drinking window are getting consumed, and that is creating scarcity, which can accelerate price appreciation. Whereas the current releases, it, it could just make sense to hold them for a longer period of time, again, until they enter that drinking window and until supply dries up a little bit. So it's it's very specific to the individual assets and you know, at the beginning, we don't really know the, the ideal timing. As, as I said, we're, it's really an ongoing month by month process wherein we're identifying just what we feel is the right opportunity for the right wines. Additionally, these are in this collection, some of the oldest wines that we have in the Vint portfolio as well. And, you know, champagne is a little bit different with disgorgement and the time between maybe when the, the grapes were harvested, the, the particular vintage and, and release. But we have, you know, the, which offering is it here we have the 2004 krug i think we have another collection where there's a 2002 of a particular wine but you know typically we're investing in you know most recent vintages it's really as an investor in in this collection it was really nice to see that the range of vintages present in this offering and how there was really strong performance across a range of vintages is that unique to champagne in this particular market cycle or uh, like what's the relationship to back vintages and older vintages and price appreciation? Yeah, I think as, as scarcity increases in particular with champagne, it's creating, it does create price appreciation. That's not unique to champagne, but champagne is typically consumed earlier than Bordeaux, for example, right? So on a, on a relative basis, it's gonna the supply is gonna start drying up <laughs> faster than it would for Bordeaux, mm -hmm. uh, even though the production of certain champagnes can be can be significant. I mean, the production of Dom Perignon is like three hundred thousand cases a year, but people people drink it up, which is great. You know, as an example, when we look at our uh, Comte de Champagne collection, which is launched uh, which is launched this past week. The market price for the oldest bottling was more than double the market price for the, the current release. And so that's just, again, a function of availability. And I would, I would also note the reason 
that people tend to drink champagne a little earlier is because most vintage champagne is is not released for I, I can't remember exactly what vintage right now, but it's about 10 years on average, give or take, maybe a little less. But so like Burgundy or Bordeaux is held, you know, two or three years in cellar and then it's released and it takes a long time to develop in bottle. And while champagne does continue to develop beautifully in the bottle, it has had 10 years basically sitting on its leaves in some senses. I mean, depending on when disgorge, but it has had an extended period of time. So that's kind of why it's ready to go and consume more quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. So when you think of, again, the, the current collection, 2011, is was released last year. So 10, 10 years old and out on the market today. So that's absolutely right. Yeah, and this, this particular offering, we've opted for sort of a piecemeal approach to liquidating. We have, obviously, our sets of whiskey. We wouldn't necessarily break up, for instance, our Glen Farkless Pagoda Series collection because part of the value of that collection is the format of the offering in terms of the compiled assets together. Same with our Lafitte Rothschild vertical collection. I assume that there's increased market demand for maybe a particular private collector that can have an instant Lafitte collection by purchasing that vertical. But with some of these other offerings that are more basket type offerings where there are a number of different producers, vintages and cuvee represented, what does it look like? How do you decide to go piecemeal approach or to sell off larger swaths? Maybe when you're bundling them, in marketplaces when we're looking to sell, what does what goes into that decision making process? Yeah, I think there are certain collections where the assets combined will command a premium. One example, you've you've named a few examples. Another one would be, you know, like our DRC assortment cases as, as an example. When you're selling a when you're selling wine in OWC in the original wooden case or the original cartons, that tends to preserve or optimize the resale value. So those wines we would most likely sell in the individual cases. I think as we continue to accumulate more assets, we will have opportunities to engage with specific collectors that, and I I know you discussed this on the last podcast, the the appeal of being able for, for a collector that doesn't, it has the resources, but doesn't have the time to acquire wines in large volumes and to ultimately basically get an instant seller. I think that is something that is will, will become increasingly relevant for us as we become a resource for, for acquisition. Yeah. And mainly when we're looking at exiting these collections, selling to restaurant groups and industry entities and institutions or selling to private individuals? What does, in terms of like offer flow, who is, yeah. you know, most likely the, does the customer change, I guess, between a basket collection versus maybe something that seems more well-suited for, you know, an instant collection, instant. I think collector. so. Yeah. I think, I think for the, the individual collector, the idea of a basket or a parcel is more attractive Whereas a merchant's going to be inclined to look for the specific assets that they need or or deem more relevant to their customer base at any given time. When we acquire wines, we, well, the way that the trade works is sometimes you do receive parcel offers or you receive offers for single assets. Our approach is always to look at the individual assets and make sure if we're if we're going to consider a parcel to make sure one, all the assets are aligned with our goals, our investment goals, and, and at, fa- at favorable acquisition costs. So it really needs to make economic sense for us to pull the trigger on a parcel. But yeah, I think from a collector point of view, that's that's going to be a great, a great vehicle for us. Great. Well, Adam, Billy, thank you so much for shedding some light on this process. Again, we are thrilled to you know offer our first distribution to investors and certainly look ahead to some of our upcoming collections as you make decisions on deploying new capital. Well, like I said, we will have a conversation, not not the next episode, but the episode following with Adam about finding value in bull markets, which, you know, we're certainly, I think, in one in the wine market right now. And wine is flexing its 0.12 correlation to the S&P 500 in, you know, being in an upswing at this time. So, We'll have that discussion with Adam and Billy on value, value finding. And certainly if you have any questions about redeploying capital back into the Vint platform or about how distributions may work 
in the future as collections that particular investor that you might be involved with if you missed out on this champagne offering. If you have any questions about that process, please reach out. But there is much more communication coming today to your email and to other places about the distribution process. And hopefully we're able to shed a little bit more light on our thinking behind that and certainly open to feedback on how we can make that process better for all the investors in the future. So feel free to reach out. But thank you, Adam. Thank you, Billy. If you have any closing things to say. Before, yeah. One, one quick thing is you may see in your portfolio page, it's we've kind of updated the formatting and that's where some of your distributions will be shown. And we added some new terminology. So if anybody has any questions, there's resources on the website about what some of the things mean, but feel free to reach out and we can help explain any of the new terms or slogans, how we've identified some of the columns. So just want to throw that out there. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vent podcast, please email us at support at vent.co. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vent platform, find us at www.vent.co. That's www.vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vent platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.